may come before the board for vote at a future time. Uh, questions will be asked by the board first, and then should any members of the audience wish to make any comments or questions uh, regarding those uh, particular topics only, uh, you'll be asked to do so at that time. And you're also asked to please limit your uh, questions and comments to five minutes so that all who wish to speak may do so. Everyone is to be aware that we are videotaping this for show later on the community cable channel. So please be advised that uh, if, if you choose to speak that you may be videotaped. Uh, all the information is on the uh, sheet that you receive when you come in. The first thing on our agenda tonight is to talk about pest management. I think, Judy, you're going to start with that. Okay, thank okay, you. Thank you. Tonight the board will be considering a proposal to adopt an integrated pest management system in the North Penn School District. Prior to Art Wood's comments, I want to provide an overview of what has occurred to date. On October 25th, Carol Curley, principal of the Montgomery Elementary School, received a call from a parent regarding her son, who was a second grader there. She said that he had been ill and she believed that the illness might be caused by the use of pesticides in the school. Ms. Curley suggested that since pesticide is used only in some areas of the kitchen, that perhaps he should bring his lunch and avoid the kitchen area. The plant operations office, which is responsible for pest management, was notified immediately of this concern. According to Ms. Curley, several parents subsequently expressed concern over the air quality in their children's classroom. Dr. Elko made an immediate decision to discontinue the use of pesticides in all schools while this issue was being reviewed. No pesticides have been used in the North Penn School District for two months. In addition, testing was done by the Montgomery County Department of Health. On November 29th, I called a meeting to bring together the concerned parents, Dr. Stephen Sklar, one of the school district's medical advisors, a representative of the Montgomery County Department of Health, school district administrators, and the president of the Montgomery Home and School Association. A presentation was made by the parents about using integrated pest management instead of continuing with the pesticide program which is currently in place. The staff of the North Penn School District responded to this parent concern. County health officials provided testing. The district medical advisor reviewed the situation and our own staff at the school and district level listened and worked to resolve this concern. The primary product used in the district's pesticide program is Jersban, a widely used pesticide which is used in the food service industries and in lawn treatment. However, because there is a reasonable alternative to chemical treatment, we are recommending that the board consider a method of pest control which relies on chemical treatment as a last and not first mode of action. I'm going to turn the program over to Art Wood for more information on the integrated pest management system. Thank you, Judy. Uh, in keeping with the green sheet that the board received and that the audience received this evening, uh, you can clearly see that we had in place a contract with Lansdale Pest Control. We had solicited sealed quotations in June of 1993, and we had used their service over the past seven years. And our current contract is in, in effect until June 30th, 1996, at a monthly fee of $345.83 which includes service to all 17 buildings. We were, uh, we quoted this over a three year period so that we wouldn't be changing providers so that we'd have some continuity and we had been quite pleased with their service. And as a result, they reflected in their quota 4% increase for the next, uh, the next two years. Interestingly enough, in that contract, that contract can be canceled by giving a 30 day okay. notice by either party prior to June 30, 1994. Based on the information that they provided, their proposal to provide IPM, the fact that they had been using a modified IPM in our, in our schools, and the increased work involved initially with IPM, they are proposing a cost of $796.33 for services in our 17 buildings. We would recommend to the board that we honor this proposal. We uh, use their service on an integrated pest management basis between now and May of 1994, at which time we can certainly do a thorough evaluation. And if it's the board's choice at that time, 
we can notify them that we are going to quote the service from other vendors and uh, receive those quotes by notifying Lansdale Pest that we will terminate and take the 30-day notice uh, advantage of the contract. So our recommendation would be that we implement a full integrated pest management program as proposed by Lansdale Pest Control in the amount of $796.33 per month. Are there any questions for Art and Judy? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. Art, it yeah. states here oh. that, <coughs> that this company does have past experience in the area of IPM. Could you tell me um, what businesses or public agencies that they've implemented such a program? I would prefer, since their principal is here this evening, and a number of their technicians, I, I would like to have him, for him to share a user's list, that would be his privilege and his prerogative and not mine. And I would prefer okay. that I, I, uh, I would ask him to do that for you, if that's appropriate, Mr. Bowman. Sure, that's fine, sir. Would you come to the microphone and ask for it? Okay, a few of the uh, contracts that we are presently working with the in, uh, Integrated Pest Management Program. One is Clemens Country Kitchen, uh, along, uh, which is the bakery of Clemens Markets. Uh, presently now, uh, North Penn School District, we are working on a strict implicated pest control management program. That helps to answer. Any other agencies, school agencies? Uh, uh, non-public agencies. agencies? No. Um, other than we do use it uh, to a few apartment buildings. The program at Clemens Country Kitchens, when did that begin? That's a fairly new company. Okay. Uh, I contract that about two years ago. And you've been using the IPM program for That is two correct. Years? No chemicals. Thank you. Uh, if I may continue to ask. Mr. Benenzia? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I would have to go back to the cost. As I look at the cost here and as I look at what you are going to go from here to here, I would have anticipated that the cost would have been less yes. as opposed to more. And I'd like to know what is I could the understand cost that. Um, when you have to compare apples with apples, it's one thing. But when you compare apples with oranges, uh, it's kind of hard to get a whole picture. Uh, our prices have been extremely low. Of course, we were the lowest bidder, according to the material here. Uh, and uh, in order for us to run through a whole school, uh, which we were not doing before, we were only spot treating target pests, uh, we need to use insect trap monitors, and we will apply them to areas where conditions are conducive to infestation. We will also uh, inspect them periodically on a monthly basis, which will be more of a labor charge than anything. That is why it exceeds more. Okay, and this price art is uh, 796.33 as for all 17 buildings. That's not per time yeah. 17. Okay. I think it breaks out. I, I don't have it. It's about $26, 26 more, per more per school. Yeah. Okay. More per school, right. Okay. You know, take a North Penn High School, the amount of time it would take to walk through the school. school. Uh, would you say this is uh, more effective than um, the use of the chemicals? I mean, are we going to have pests? I think, I think two things will happen. I think it's going to be a better program as it relates to the well-being of the people in the building and the fear that has been set forth with pesticides. I also think in the research that we've done and with the tape show that, or the slide tape program that we saw from San Diego and a number of other school districts that we spoke with, that you really spend more time uh, sealing cracks, sealing areas, and trying to circumvent the entrance of pests and rodents into your buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think over the long haul, David Weitz was kind enough to share with us a tape uh, regarding what the federal government does in Washington. They have a, a pest guru that has implemented a total IPM program 
And some of the things that they talk about is just, you know, caulking and, and doing things to, to prevent pests from coming into the building. We all know that, that pests and rodents need food. We certainly supply them. When you look at our setting in a school, when you have an elementary building and you have 25 youngsters in a classroom, typically there are 30 cupcakes 25 times a year for birthdays. So, I mean, we know that, that we're providing what, what ants need, what roaches need. And, and, and field mice result, need more if, in the winter. If I could uh, read off a little bit of the philosophy of integrated pest management, that may answer a few of your questions for you. Mr. Benenzi, I'm sorry. I, really, sure. I can't hear you. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> it's the ice if, maker. If I could read off the philosophy, uh, a little bit of the philosophy of integrated pest management. I, I'd appreciate that because questions. I know nothing of it. Sure. And I feel that there's a, a glaring gap of information as far as I'm concerned as one board member. I have been in the industry 17 years, and I'll be more than happy to explain it to you. Implicated, um, uh, integrated pest management, also known as IPM, is defined as controlling pests through sanitation, mechanical exclusions, non-chemical devices, and uh, well, and well necessary uh, the use of uh, pesticides, more or less when necessary. Uh, certain pest infestations can affect the health of our children. Stinging and biting insects are unwanted. Some pests, such as cockroaches, can cause allergic reactions in children, especially those suffering from asthma. Pests in schools can carry and transmit diseases. Uh, therefore, a pest management program is not only desirable, but is needed. Let's see here. Landsell Pest Control and its staff has always engaged and participated in an implicated integrated pest management program, also demonstrating professionalism as a guardian of the environment. We understand that there is a controversy between people and pesticides, and anything that is a potential health risk draws a concern. But Landsell Pest Control has proposed an addendum to the contract, as Art had mentioned. So working with the, um, the baits uh, will put no parts per million per billion in the air that we breathe. We have been using these methods all the way back in 1990 with North Penn School District. We have used chemicals as an, as an alternative method and a last resort with the exception of the routine crack and crevice application to the kitchen area. That is the only difference that will take place from what was to what is with integrated pest management. So should this uh, fail or should this uh, uh, program, this program become weak work, and we be taken over by pests, then you will, go, uh, will re restore under, the integrity of the building by using the pesticides? We yes. did that over the Christmas holiday or over the holiday. We, uh, we had a situation where we had some more activity than we liked. Oh. And we brought, uh, we brought Sal in and his firm in based on an IPM methodology. And I need to tell you, we had good success. In junior high, we reduced the roach problem that you were hearing about. We dealt with the mice at Penfield. We, we dealt with ants at York Avenue. And things worked well using the method that we're proposing here. Uh, I can tell you just from the contact with our building people that his technicians spent more time in the buildings than they had in the past. And I, you know, that sort of reflects where we're going as far as the expenditure is concerned. If I could just make a, a, one last remark here as to a, maybe a logic stream here. If we're going to go this method, I look here about cracks, crevices, whatever, then I would think that this would have to go hand in hand with some sort of a maintenance supportive effort. It can't just be left to the pest control yes, people. We're also be, going to have to have our maintenance people both, on top of this. There will be a well thought out plan and a plan of attack, yes. I mean, if he's seeing, if he's seeing a gap in, in ceramic tile in a kitchen, for example, where it meets the floor, that's certainly going to be our obligation to seal it. I mean, I wouldn't expect him, you know, that, that's something we're going to have to do if it's right. a, you know, if it's a settlement that runs the length of a wall. If it's, if it's something small and they can track, or they can track the, the fact that ants are coming in that opening, they have a material that they use to, to seal it. So art is going to be a combination of identifying where the cracks and the and the infestation is coming through, 
and between their product and our and our caulking or our ceilings or whatever is going to be a combination. I think it will be more on their part. I mean, we we typically maintain from the standpoint if there's a if there's a glaring opening mm -hmm. that you know in, in our building, we will deal with that under routine maintenance. But until is it going to be an instantaneous um, fixing of it, or is it going to be if you if they identify an opening? You know, for a mouse or whatever, hopefully just mice. Um, are they going to treat that, or are they going to inform you so that you can seal it well, up immediately? They, you know, they what's will the inform, time frame? Usually, it works in the reverse. They typically would come into our building for their regular service and check in with the custodian after children had left the building. Sign in. We had a sign-in sheet, and that sign-in sheet would indicate if there were problems that we had identified over that period. Okay. On the other hand, if we had infestation and we received a call from a building custodian or a building principal, we would dispatch them immediately throughout the service time in the month, mm -hmm. and they would deal with it. That won't, that won't change drastically. I mean, they're going to be on call. They're going to be responsive to our needs, but they're also going to have a regular maintenance program. Okay. But once we have infestation, I mean, it's not uncommon if we have a swarm of bees, if we have a, a lot of mice coming into a building, that they just respond and, and do what they have to do. And as, as he pointed out earlier, we, we've been using, I mean, glue traps have been used in this district for a long time. And that's, that's a method of, of, of trapping mice uh, that's, under, that's recommended under IPM. Uh, he has invested in more sophisticated equipment. Uh, it's kind of a, an automated mousetrap that he used at Penfield over the, over the holiday that was most successful. Just as long as it's a combination of, of both as opposed to just mostly <coughs> the pesticide, not the pesticide, but the pest control without us taking permanent measures so that we don't have, you know, the opening gaps and all. I mean, I think, you know, we, we have always tried the, the replacement of the gym floor at, at Penfield when we dealt with the, the massive termite problem we had, you know. That's behind us, and, and that type of maintenance is the thing we need to do. I mean, if, there, if there's an apparent opening and, and there's a, a definite tra uh, track as to where mice are coming into a building, we need to deal with it. Okay. We know our roaches many times come in on our delivery on cardboard ca uh, cartons when we have product delivery. They happen to, to like the glue on the cardboard carton joints very much, and they travel with, with delivery people. Oh, sounds like fun. Are, are we to assume that there's, it, within the cost that you've quoted, that there are no initial startup costs because anything that has to be done will be the responsibility of the school district? Uh, as far as that goes, uh, I'm just going to have to say I would have to see how it goes through the period of the next couple months. Providing that the school district is going to make all the proper repairs and it's done properly, then uh, I don't see any <coughs> high calls coming from the install pest control. It will be blend right into the maintenance program, if that answers I mean, it. We have, we have a checklist here, okay, along with the, the, the report book that we report into. We will be using a checklist of uh, fl different floor level inspections with sanitation and pest control, as well as ex uh, the mechanical exclusions will be mentioned in here so we can work at it as time goes on. It'll be a progressive thing. Let's face it, you're dealing with some old schools. Uh, North Pen Pendale Junior High School has been around since, since I attended that school. And there are going to be more areas to seal there than it would be as if you used look at uh, North Penn High School. I understand what you're saying, but the, on, on, talking about the cost. Providing there's no labor involved from Lansdale Pest Control, there will be no additional cost, okay, in sealing the cracks. Can you help me with this, Art? Yeah, uh, I think uh, one of the things that Sal, the point that you're missing, he has invested, for an example, in a couple of crack sealing guns that his technicians use. And that's not a cost of ours, and the work that he's doing when they're coming in for their visual inspection has not been an addition. I mean, that's part of this service. I, I, what I'm, 
I, I know what you're saying. What I'm looking for is some real definition of who's responsible for what, when, <coughs> and when, when, when do we get to a point where we say, well, as the district, we've done everything we're supposed to do as far as sealers and, and uh, hole management, whatever you want to call it, and the program is working or it just isn't working, or somebody said, well, Sal should have done this. Sal says, well, I thought you were going to do this. I, I don't see the definition here and, and the, the strong lines of responsibilities. Well, each job is a, an art of its own. Okay, so there is really not one picture to look at here, but I'm sure with the communications with Art Wood, John Strobel, Marie Derrickson, and Kathy Weigel, Weigel uh, we have a very good rapport between the two. We've never really had too many misunderstandings, have we, Art? Now, the interesting thing, Bill, I think to put, a, to put it in a, in a clearer picture is the proof in the pudding is that we don't have rodents and pests. And, you know, I don't see our people doing any extra work in the beginning. The onus is on Sal. When we came back after the holiday, we saw that our problems went away. We didn't do anything. We being the school district, he did it all. There's not a lot to do, is that There's, what we're saying? Well, the, you, you know our buildings well okay. enough that what is there to do? I mean, if you, okay. walk, in, if you walk into the Montgomery Elementary School or, or the Gwinnett Square Elementary School or even uh, an A.M. Culp or an Oak Park, or, I mean, the condition <laughs> of the kitchen and the cleanliness of the kitchen there's just not gaping, gaping cracks and gaping holes and, and that type of thing. Okay. So I, I don't really, you know. It's not a big issue then. Not a big uh, issue okay. for me. It if won't be a big issue. If a mechanical exclusion falls to where we need to keep flies out of a building, we will offer and submit a proposal on an air blanket system that will run down through the, the front door or the door of the entry area and keep the insects from actually flying through the barrier of this air. That would be an extra charge okay. of the air blanket. But again, each job is an art of its own. I just can't answer that, that one question. Understand. You're happy with it? I'm happy with okay. it. Well, could I You're happy with it? Yeah, I have, I have no problems. I mean, we're going to have that opportunity between now and May to evaluate the service. And right. believe me, we have many evaluators. <laughs> <laughs> our, our people have had such pest-free environments that the phone jumps off the hook quickly as you see six ants and, and one roach, quite frankly. Or, okay. can, I, can I ask, have you heard any instances at other schools other than this particular school where dirt stands considered a problem or has affected any of the children? Have you heard I, from I any have, other school in the district? And I guess my next question is, if you know, it looks like we're going to go, if we would go district wide with this whole thing, was there any consideration put into perhaps um, if, if indeed we can prove that this is a problem, which I, the evidence I have here, I'm not positive that this proves that the third span is a problem. Yes, there are many suggestions, but to me, I haven't seen anything proof positive. Um, is there, has there been any thought to, okay, we, are we, okay, we'll, we'll discontinue third span at this particular school, but continue um, the, the control the way we have been doing it at the remaining schools if a problem arises address it then or was it just automatically policy to go to the whole district we, we kind of proposed and as we met uh, we agreed that if we do it we would do it across <coughs> the entire district uh, we have not have I have not had complaints from any other building I don't know whether Mrs. Clark seen. has it's the only building that you've heard anything I think Tom brings up a good point, and I have to have to concur to some point, but I, I just want to explain how I thought that through, uh, Tom. Um, I don't purport or even, you know, would, uh, you know, fantasize a guest to being any, you know, environmentalist or somebody that would support such works. I probably have more of a Rush Limbaugh mentality when it comes to this sort of thing with the environment. But um, I, I have to say that it, you know, it should be across the board. Uh, I praise God that I have sturdy, healthy kids. But if, you know, if it's one kid, two kids, a handful here and there, you know, when we go to the nth degree in so many other areas of busing and special needs children, et cetera, et cetera, this is just another entity or another area where we're going to be expected to go to the nth degree for health, safety, and welfare of these kids. Uh, I resent the cost. God, I hate spending money. But. I think it's just something that we have to do, and um, 
you know, I'm not going to get all wild and crazy about it and, and, and have, you know, durst band headaches day in and day out. But at the same time, it's not worth it if one kid is. And uh, we have to do what we have to do. And it's, um, I think it's just a health, safety, and welfare issue. There is a, uh, I provided for the board a parent, the parent who had the, the child who was um, coming ill with the, uh, with the durst band uh, provided some information late yesterday afternoon to the school district and we made copies available for you um, in your packet for you to read and there are some uh, references to some medical journal articles and physicians opinions but I, I do want to tell you we, we had some conversations and I think the medical community would have a varying opinion on the topic uh, you could probably find other physicians who would say that it's not a problem Dow Chemical Company I believe is the manufacturer of Durspan they would volunteer to provide medical evidence and, and research to support the fact, obviously, they have a multi-million dollar, billion dollar investment perhaps in this chemical, and they would provide um, medical testimony that says that it is safe. But, um, you know, it, it, is it one of those things where um, now uh, it, we don't know whether it's safe or not, and five or six years from now we're going to find out that it's dangerous? Um, the, the cost differential, nobody wants to see us spend more money, but uh, the total cost differential is a few hundred dollars a month for the entire school district and um, on an $88 million budget, I, I think it's, it's not that significant. And if we try it for just a few months, we'll have a good track record. We, as Art said, we tried over the holidays on, a, on three different schools to treat the problem with an integrated pest management. Uh, this is a local company. Art knows where to find the owner of the company. He's going to North Penn Schools. Um, yes, probably one big manufacturer, Ehrlich, or some of the others in the area might might want to come forward and, and create a proposal and, and undercut his costs at this point. But you know, we've had a good relationship with this vendor, and uh, I think Art's recommendation is in in June if you want to bid it out and, and secure quotes for a three-year period or whatever, uh, then it's fair game to, to other vendors and, and to this gentleman as well to sharpen his, uh, sharpen his pencil. And he has some costs now that he's not absolutely certain about that he has to eat uh, to get involved in this process. And we think that uh, for the time being, it would be a good approach. It's not that expensive. And um, we would hate to find out down the road that the Durst Band is a product that can that can injure children that's that's administration's summary I would say in terms of where our thinking would be on this topic can, can we place it on our particular uh, for May that in fact Art Wood will come forward with a report at that time Absolutely. for us that it will definitely happen but I just have one question that the gentleman brought up a, uh, a point about a preventive type of um, Process. I guess you were talking about the flaws and, and things of that nature. Um, given the fact that we're building two schools, what exactly do we incorporate within that construction? Some type of infestation control, or you know that type of well, study I, I or whatever. Well, I think each time, you know, each time we do new construction, <coughs> we're we're dealing with a with a visqueen vapor barrier that's under the concrete. <coughs> We're dealing with a, 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 the integrity of new materials. You have funded quarry tile floors, ceramic tile walls, the kinds of things that don't encourage, quite frankly, uh, infestation of pests. And other than that, you know, it, uh, I think the type of materials, I think it's so important that, that uh, you know, we, we continue. And, and architects will specify for that very reason the kinds of materials that we're using in buildings. But I think if you look at a, I mean, I, I have never gone back to check the records because John Strobel deals with it more closely than I do, but I don't think you've spent much time in Gwinnett Square mm -hmm. with, with problems there. We know that if we leave food out, if there's something left over the weekend, somehow or other, and it's no different than your house and my house, ants come from somewhere. And, uh, you know, they, they need to have food. And the best well, thing we can do is get better at, at taking their food source away. Well, it's different from mine because it's 200 years old yeah, and the mice come in that. everywhere, so yeah. <laughs> you can't help <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> I need a great <laughs> pest manager. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to just um, finish with my questioning. Um, 
the deadline, the date that's here for May of 1994, does that represent the 30-day notice for a probationary period, a one year? No. Because it's odd. It's two years prior. We say we have a contract for 96, yet it can be canceled uh, yeah, the, if we give notice as of May of 1994. The and that's at each anniversary date, either party can give a 30-day oh, notice. Oh, at each anniversary date. Uh, second, what you were speaking about as far as leaving food out, well, yeah, it happens in our houses, but we have maybe five or six, some of us nine people in our houses right, that we right. have to give lessons to. What do we have to do within our schools since we have our birthday parties, we have our holiday events, we have our kids with their lunch bags in their lockers that may be two weeks old. This is a topic uh, that we deal with with our head custodians in our head custodian meeting. We, we talk about this type of maintenance and this type of prevention. And we talk about the need. You don't go away Friday and you tell your, your custodial cleaners that if there's something out over the weekend, one of the things we have a tendency to do, and it, it's the kindness that exists within our staff. Our people, teachers that leave on Friday, if they've had a party, always leave something for our custodians. So we, we need to remember <laughs> that we just don't leave it there until Monday. Well, that's great for the custodians, but what about the things inside the lockers or in the dust that's drawers? The custodians, we don't we need to educate the rest of our staff, those who, who would be the ones that need to know that this has to stop? We have to be more cautious, even our own. When we have a spoiled children. lunch in a locker, believe me, my custodians will identify that in a hurry. When we have ants coming out of the louvers of a locker, our custodians see that. Teachers bring, <laughs> teachers bring that to us regularly. That's not uncommon. Well, you know, then you've already got evidence of a problem yeah. there. I'm just wondering if we need to do something as far as our environmental program that we, we spend some time letting them know what this might mean, a responsibility on the I part of everyone. I think that's a good suggestion. We when, we, when we saw the slide share presentation, that was one of the recommendations that they made. You have to do education with your own people as and a first priority. <laughs> But it's not going to change. I think the key thing is that we're going to be attacking the outside of the buildings to keep the pests from getting in. And the better job we do with that, then even though they're careless and will leave out, that, that, that there's less opportunity for pests to get in. Um, my concern is, Art, if we, we start now and, and evaluate this program through the end of May, is that enough time? It seems like the peak ant period is like in the summer because that's when I always see them. But maybe, you know, we have different pests at different times of the year, I'm sure, and that judging from large to small from what the problems we've had in the past, is it is four months essentially or five months enough time to evaluate whether this is better than five months <coughs> period from last year, for example, same period? Is there time to do that? Um, we, we feel there is. We, we know that a drought such as this past summer increases and infestation. That is correct. And as a result, we think we think that's adequate time. If it's not, I will certainly come back to the board and I'll work something out with Sal okay. and, and ask if we can extend it. I mean, he's a very reasonable person. He's the kind of person, although we have a contract, if I tell him, you know, we need to go to September and at that point we're going to requote. In, in tying with what Bill, Bill asked about then, as I understand it from your gentleman's agreement, Sal's guys fix what they can given the opportunity to fix it at the time. Otherwise, they notify the building staff or you of areas that have to, larger areas that have to be fixed. Is that, that's basically where the line is drawn that on is who correct. does what? Okay. Um, and third, it would seem to me that as we get better at doing that, ultimately, the cost of the maintenance would go down in terms of the amount of time the technicians have to spend at the building since we cut out the opportunities and the, and the, the, the roadways, so to speak, for the, the rodents and the, and the pests to get into the building. Therefore, it's less places to monitor and things like that. Is that, is that, is that a reasonable? Yes, but by uh, applying more insect trap monitors, we'll give us an earlier detection on the pests which will then enable us to eliminate the infestation before 
it gets out of hand. Great. Okay. Thank you. That takes care of my questions. Any other ones on the board? I think it, the thing to remember here is that, that uh, we've not been doing anything for a few months. We had some emergency stuff over the holidays. I think it's critical uh, that we get going on it now. When we have a vendor that we have a relationship with, that it's the only sane thing to do because we've got to get this thing going again. If we went out and did, took any other course, uh, we're going to have additional problems that we can't afford the kids at the school because it's unsanitary for everybody. Also, I don't feel we have time to acclimate a new company it, exactly. to all of our buildings and the ins and outs and the staff and this and that oh, to even to build a relationship with them. I think the, the well, given amount of time here is more than fair to see time and stuff. time and taking to, to uh, get a proposal out and get bids. It, it's just downtime. Right? No problem. And, uh, I, and I'm comfortable with that. Art, could I ask, it's, it basically ties back to what Bill was getting at as far as us being able to get a picture of where the responsibility is falling, where the costs are falling as what's a part of the contract price versus what we're supplementing through our own personnel efforts. Uh, is it possible without uh, overwhelming you with paperwork and bureaucracy and, and, and taking, you know, being costly in that way, to do something like a monitoring system of what is being done through through this company as opposed to where we're picking up at you know sort of like our vandalism report is done we get, a little we, different way but you could give us a report as to what additional costs we're having above and beyond the contract that's be, that's Sal gives us, a part of our maintenance. our people have maintained good records and Sal sends to us in fact we received the holiday uh, report telling us what he did what buildings he went into he highlights a floor plan for each building, showing us where the infestation was, telling us what he used, type of traps, what he did for common household ants, and we get that kind of report from him. In turn, he can add to that report the kinds of things that he's identified. There may be things happening in a building that we won't even know about. He may point out an expansion joint mm -hmm. that has opened because the caulking had dried out, we may have a, a, a custodian when Sal's man there is there that will just follow up and repair that. Mm -hmm. And we would only know that if you would say to John or myself, you know, when we're there, well, you know, I had a crack here in an expansion joint and I just sealed it as per Sal's recommendation. But if it's a major, we will certainly know about it. And I don't see anything out of the ordinary as far as preventive maintenance that we would do anyhow. An expansion joint that dries out and opens up we want to recalk it anyhow. But while we're evaluating this, and since we're going to be making a, a formal decision in a few months, I'd just like to see us maintain both reports, what our in-staff do maintenance is doing as opposed to the organization. Thanks. Any other questions from the board? One board, who does the outside inspections? Uh, I'd like Thanks to see it. some attendance report comparisons last year, the year before, versus the upcoming year once we implement this. and. Do we do a uh, nurse Tenants incident pass report? Pardon me? Tenants of pests or kids? Not who is out sick or who is not out sick or who is attending, just numbers. Okay. To see if it's. Count the ants and count the kids. Skip the ants. That may not tell you anything. Yes. A serious outbreak of flu, of flu in one school or chicken pox. can drive attendance yeah, or chicken pox. You're or right. Yeah, so. I'm not going to go But we do have That's recorded wrong. instances. Vicki, we you do have, have records. Or I'm sorry, Terry, we do have records of of uh, children becoming ill during school and going to the the well, nurse. The, where the so nurse is there. The nurse is keep the And how many are home? Or even. Um, Any other questions? I don't know. Are there any questions like from members of the audience? Ma'am? Uh, Sal, if I could ask you please to step Thank aside. You. Or you, you may sit sure. Down at the Thank you. Thanks for your insight. Thank you. Well, I'm Connie Aish. I'm uh, Michael Aish's mother. And uh, I spent uh, 11 and a half years in the pharmacology lab, and I have my master's in pharmacology. So when my son started to come home uh, with headaches and uh, nausea last year, I thought it was a bad flu year. 
And uh, I, it was a little unusual. No one else in the family got it. But he was out at least one day, just about every week, starting in November of last year. And he recovered whenever he was out of school. So this year, when I heard that other children were having the same symptoms, I started keeping track. And in the packet of information I dropped off uh, yesterday, um, the test results and some of my observations uh, over three weeks uh, made it very clear that when he went to the cafeteria, he became sick. Headaches, nausea, uh, on a couple of occasions it turned into diarrhea that lasted uh, quite a long time, but he definitely recovered when he went home. So when I found out that Durspan was being used in the school, I was familiar with the mechanism of action of Durspan, and I knew that his symptoms could have been caused by it. So uh, I looked into what tests should be done, blood tests, and then I requested those blood tests. And if you look at your information, you will find that indeed his blood tests show that his cholinesterase in his red blood cells was inhibited. I looked up information on this blood test as, whether, as well as uh, uh, information in other uh, medical articles. I find that when you go to the company, you get biased information, of course, because it's like listening to a commercial on TV. I tell my kids, you know, does the game really look like that when you buy it? And also, uh, I understand where some people might not uh, believe the information that comes from environmental groups. So although I got some initial information from there, I know to get the most unbiased information, you go right to the medical literature, which is kind of difficult for the average person to do because you have to go to the index medicus, look up the proper um, articles, then go to each journal and look through the journal and Xerox the ones that you need. It's very time consuming, so I did that for you. I, I gave you a couple of uh, articles that are very interesting. Anyway, I found that inhibit when uh, the blood test comes out low for red blood, colon red blood cell cholinesterase, it's a 95% uh, sure uh, you can count on it, 95% sure, that they were poisoned with an organophosphate such as Durspan. Okay, the other 5% uh, could be liver disease, skin disease, and I think cancer, which has all been ruled out in Michael's case. So, you know, it's pretty positive that he was poisoned by Durspan. Also, you can see he's had three blood tests afterwards, and um, it, you can see how it has recovered over five weeks for, after leaving school. Also, his symptoms have not reoccurred. Anything that he's had, the rest of the family's had ever since, and his energy level's up. And also, from looking, there's a lot of literature right now in the medical in uh, medical journals about Durspan poisoning. And I think some of that is because it's supposed to be, uh, I, I read in the paper it was supposed to be safe enough to drink. <laughs> and uh, from the, the, um, the journal articles that I've given you, it's, um, it causes peripheral neuropathy. It causes nerve damage. One MD was poisoned by exterminator uh, when an exterminator came into her house and sprayed Durspan. She had memory loss and confusion, and she never recovered. So this causes um, things like blurred vision, memory loss, and uh, Michael was having trouble tracking. He, he was in the higher reading group. He knew all the words, but his eyes could not follow the words. Since he's been home, he's recovered from this. And he's recovered from other, like, muscle weakness and uh, other symptoms that I wasn't, I didn't initially. Oh, another thing was bone pain. And I can't tell you how many children have been complaining about bone pain. 
and how many children who have had diarrhea for two weeks and their parents don't know why and they've taken them to the doctors. So uh, I don't think that this, you know, up until now the information hasn't really been out, but I, I hope that you'll all read the packet of information I've given you because I don't think you'll get this kind of information anywhere unless you go to the medical library yourself and that's kind of difficult to do. Also, there was a question about had this happened at any other school and one mother from Inglewood was saying uh, that a classroom last year was shut down for a couple of weeks while it was detoxed. The children were moved into the cafeteria and I was wondering if anybody knew, and it may have nothing to do with this, but it seemed to have been hushed up and uh, I don't know why you know, uh, this happened. But this came from a mother from Inglewood that said that. This is the first time hearing that, Mrs. Ashley. Okay. And, and normally the principal would call. Okay. Uh, well, maybe that should be looked into. I think that uh, this was not, um, I, I don't know, I kind of like mass amounts of information when I'm dealing with something. And if I, if if there's a problem, I would tend to investigate, although uh, it seems as though, like, for instance, the teacher was never even questioned as to uh, the health of her students, even though she made up a list of children who were experiencing symptoms. She herself has been sick, and in December she was sick a lot, and she has the same headaches and nausea. And I guess you can blame it, she has MS, you could blame it on that, but I think it might just make her more sensitive to this. Also, I'm not convinced, the reason I haven't sent Michael back uh, is that I'm not convinced that the Durst ban is gone, and because he's been exposed for such a long time, he may be very sensitive to it. Uh, the tests that the State Department did were just air samples, and I've talked to the Department of Agriculture as well as environmental labs. They say that it would not show up in air samples unless you took it one or two days after, at the most three days after it was sprayed. You would have to take swabbings with ice, using isopropyl alcohol. And we don't believe that the children were poisoned by inhaling it. We think that it either, either was absorbed through the skin or possibly uh, I was just imagining how it could get from the kitchen into the cafeteria. Possibly someone used the rag that was in the kitchen to wipe off the tables in the cafeteria and the children could have touched it and got it into their mouth that way. And uh, it seems as though that the children who take their lunch don't seem to be as ill as the children who have bought it. Um, thank you, Mrs. Ash. Okay, thank you. I would ask if you please, uh, would you continue to have your child monitored since we're not using Durspan anymore to I, see I if will. the levels change? I, I hope to send him back to school as of March 1st, and I will have him monitored before. And if he, he has any symptoms, I will have definitely have him monitored. Understanding yeah. that there are other ways to get Colin S3, I guess it is, uh, level or to, to achieve that other than with Durspan. Well, only other organic fossils, yes. And I understand, but I'm, I'm just know, saying if that... If the symptoms had, been, had shown up other places, then I would have suspected that. They <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Good evening, members of the school board. I'm Sharice Krieger. I'm also a Montgomery School parent. I'm a nurse. Prior to moving here in uh, September of 1992, um, I worked as a nurse in the state of California. I was also a planning commissioner for the city of Oceanside and was the special liaison from the planning commission to the environmental planning department for the city of Oceanside. It was in that capacity that I was asked to serve as an environmental educator for the Environmental Health Coalition in San Diego. Uh, the Environmental Health Coalition put together a school pesticide use reduction plan which was presented to the San Diego City Schools and was adopted of January 1991. I took the program to the uh, 50 
elementary schools. And uh, this is why I, I, I feel it was very necessary for me to get up and speak tonight. I wasn't able to um, receive the agenda item before this evening and in reading the proposal from Lansdale Chemical Company I've noticed that there are some uh, components uh, that are very necessary for an effective um, IPM that are missing from this proposal. Um, I have brought along with me this evening the same slideshow which is 10 minutes in duration that I gave on November 29th to the committee that met in this same room. Um, I would ask uh, Mr. Bowman uh, if you could indulge me for those 10 minutes since there seems to be uh, a lack of knowledge amongst the board members on what truly an IPM is. I think that you will find it very educational. I think that you will find it very informative and I think it will give you a better and clearer picture as to what is actually required and needed for an effective integrated pest system. I'm not saying that Lansdale Chemical Company is not capable of doing the job in conjunction with the school district, but there doesn't seem to be any indication in either your staff report from your administrators or Lansdale Chemical Company on some of the significant components that are necessary to make an effective program work so that you do not need to resort to the use of toxic chemicals. Perhaps, uh, is this a scripted slideshow? Yes, it is. Perhaps if you left that with us and then the, the board members at a, at a time that's more convenient, perhaps sit down with the Pet Lansdale Pest Control to uh, review it all at the same time and go through the script. Uh, that way we could uh, look at it and perhaps adjust our program as we proceed through our contract. Had the slideshow not cost me $100, Mr. Bowman, I would be more than willing to leave it here. But this is the second slideshow that I've had to replace out of my own pocket money. And it's not that I don't trust anybody here, but I don't want to lose this one. Um, it would only take 10 minutes, and I think that your audience, as well as your audience at home that will be viewing this in the future, would find this very informative, and it would bring about uh, the much-needed volunteer uh, core that you will need to properly educate the community and get the children online uh, and, and on board to pay closer attention uh, on their pest control responsibilities. Uh, what we'll do is we'll, uh, if, if you're available sometime maybe later this week, we can schedule a time here in the ESC to, uh, to view the slides and any of the board members who can attend would like to do that. Are you available in the afternoon or early evening? Yes. Uh, perhaps since you don't want to leave your uh, slides uh, to us. Uh, uh, perhaps, <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame her. I'd be willing to come. I, but I'd like to see it before we vote next Thursday. Okay. Well, I would like to be present. I would like to see this. <coughs> well. Okay. For the purpose of, of my testimony this evening, though, I'd, I, I would like to at least let the board know, since maybe not all of you could attend that meeting. Um, the first and most significant component in an IPM, of course, is education. Outreach to the students. Excuse me a second. It, it, if, is it possible for us to make a copy of your script also, it, even if we don't see the slides? Is that possible? Uh, well, but the script is, is basically tied into each slide, so you really need to see it. Um, education means simply informing persons that are occupying spaces where pest problems have occurred of the conditions would cause those pest problems. Redesigning or rebuilding is the second component. This means replacing structural conditions that attract pests with conditions that discourage pests. Examples include the use of garbage cans that are least accessible to rats and installing perhaps self-closing screen doors, trimming away trees around the landscape, in the landscape around uh, the buildings that may lean up to windows, things of that nature also help to cut back on ant uh, infestation. Habitat modification. This strategy focuses on eliminating the life, su life supports of the pests such as food, water, hiding and breeding grounds. Examples including caulking cracks as has been discussed here tonight, screening vents, repairing water leaks and drains and removing debris piles that may be around some of your buildings. Physical controls. These include pest management techniques that require repeated application and maintenance such as barriers, traps, simple fly swatters, and vacuum and absorptive dusts. Biological controls. These include parasites and predators that naturally kill pests. Some are available commercially, such as ladybugs. You can buy ladybugs in mass quantity, and they're dirt cheap, 
and you can let them out on every site, in every, on every school grounds, and that will contribute significantly, significantly in the reduction of outside intrusions, intruders. Chemical controls should only be used as a last result. Chemical controls include attractants, repellents, growth hormones, sterilants, and poisons, all of which are supposed to kill the pests. When chemical controls appear to be necessary, only the least toxic chemicals should be used. I have a handout here for uh, you tonight. Uh, the first page of this involves the economic edge of school IPMs. There are four examples of the significant savings uh, that were incurred by different school districts and municipal governments once they uh, implemented IPM. And I'd like to read you one because this person is, is very close by and would be easily accessible uh, by, by any of you should you choose to call him. His phone number is also included on this page. Prior to IPM implementation in 1985, the Montgomery County Public School System in Maryland was expending $2,400 a year per, per school for conventional pest control at 11 different locations. Their current cost employing IPM is $575 per school year, with further anticipated reductions on the horizon. According to the MCPS Pest Management Supervisor, Bill Forbes, they have fewer pests as well. The MCPS Food Service Warehouse also adopted an IPM program and concurrently realized an 80% reduction in pest management costs. Loss prevention is another amenity of IPM. An additional savings of $30,000 occurred between 1985 and 1988 as a result of IPM tactics which detected infested product. As far as Mr. Clemens' comments about uh, only doing it at one school, I'd like to read something uh, to you which I found well, to be very... I think the key is we're doing it at all the schools. And, and I, know, but I, just want to, I know, but I just want to read something to you to, to, to drive my point even home, be home even a little bit further. Sure. Okay. In June of 1990, an Iowa District Court jury awarded $1.5 million to five women who were permanently disabled by exposure to Dursban. Following exposure in the county office building where they worked, they suffered peripheral neur neuropathy, central nervous system effects, and immune system dysfunction. So I will hand this out and I'm willing to come whenever you want me to to show you the slideshow. I think it can be used as a, a very effective educational tool uh, should you decide to do truly an effective IPM. And I do have some concerns with the way it's laid out here now. I don't think it will be effective in the long run. I'll have uh, Ken Weir call you tomorrow if uh, you'd be available. I'll be home in the morning. I have to work in the afternoon. Just and uh, set up a time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience on this topic? Thank you. Uh, sure, I'm find my agenda again here. Uh, we're going to talk about the architect now. Art, is that yours? Yes. Uh, I've included in your packet a green sheet that will help the new board members understand how the process evolved as it relates to the selection of a high school architect. Yesterday we had the privilege of visiting four high schools, four secondary buildings. Actually, one is a, a, an intermediate school that really is attached to a high school complex. The other was a middle school, two high schools. And it was basically the identical tour that we took with Mrs. Bukowski and, and Mr. Redcamp, Redcamp, but yesterday we included Mrs. Scher, Mr. Allen, Mr. Clemens, and Mr. White. So in that process, we had an opportunity to see the work of the architects that we interviewed. And I would suggest at this point that the board <coughs> needs to bring forward some kind of discussion that will move us in the direction of making a selection. Anyone want to comment on their uh, tour uh, Monday? Tom's a good driver. <laughs> <laughs> you trusted it to Tom? <laughs> Tom did a great job. Uh, I, I would like to comment. One of the first things I noticed 
Well, I would say that one of the first things I thought of after the tour was you can tell a difference between architects in a building. Mm -hmm. um, and there are things that there's things that make a difference when you when you look at a building, and I'm not just talking the outside, but the inside, the details, the way they can make things look with without a lot of cost. Those that make that effort and those that don't. Those that, that take care of, of little details that most people won't think of until five years, ten years down the road when you're fixing that problem or you're saying, boy, why didn't we do this or why did they design it this way? You can tell a difference. and In my opinion, there is a difference. And it's not something that you just say, what's the difference? Just grab the cheapest guy or the most expensive guy. There are differences to be noted. And I could tell them, and I am very glad I went on this tour. I also say that it was uh, invaluable to uh, talk to building administrators that were part of the process of uh, the construction of those schools. Uh, they were all extremely candid of their opinions about the, the architects, what was done properly, what was deficient, and what was outright wrong. And uh, from that point of view, a very interesting trip. Okay. Any suggestions? Anyone else? Terry, you went the last time. I found the same thing to be true. Is, is you, you really saw a lot of things, a lot of, they were very candid, the administrators, um, what things to look out for, what things you want to have in there. And, and there was a difference in, in who, you, who you select. One. I know who I'd like to I'm concerned if, uh, if we delay the past the next uh, voting meeting, uh, <laughs> selecting an architect because of the time schedule for uh, for that high school and, and uh, getting on with the educational specs. Uh, does the administration have a recommendation to move, that would move us forward to a I, vote at the next meeting? I think that uh, we shared with you a time schedule, a uh, time frame for the construction of the building, and we, we face many challenges before we even can go to bid. And as a result of that, I, I think the sooner we can move on the process, there's so much work to be done, and I think the weather that we've shared this week and what it has done to us at Walton Farm and, and Bridal Pass certainly reminds me of the fact that a 26-month construction window is not being overly generous with what we have to do to bring a secondary building online. So I would, I would encourage the board if you can bring it to closure, to bring it to closure as soon as you possibly can. I've, you know, I've had the advantage of, of seeing the proposals, seeing the high schools, and interviewing uh, the, the uh, three architects. Uh, I'm very comfortable in making the decision. The question is, does the, board want to, does the full board want to interview the architects, or is the board comfortable making a decision with, without an additional interview process? I, I guess I'll I think seven of, us, the, uh, seven of us the interviewed the architects and the other, uh, the, the ones that were not there went on the tour. I think we're ready. What? I would I think we're, we're ready. ready. And, and some of them. I'm ready. Okay. Is, the, is, the, is the facilities committee uh, ready to, uh, are, would you guys like to come forward with a, 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 a nomination or a proposal for a recommendation that we can consider before next week as to whether that's the one that we would particularly choose and debate that then? Between Ralph, uh, Bill, and, and I would say it was very clear which the best building was, which the best, the, the, of the, the buildings that reviewed, there wasn't one particular, there were a few which one particular um, architect had worked on. I would have to wholeheartedly agree with that, that that, that, that particular architect stood out. And, and I would be ready if, if we're in a financial position to do it and without seeing all the facts where we are financially, but it, um, I would say as far as from a facility standpoint, being comfortable with a with what we've seen, I'm comfortable. And that is to recommend Ooh. Mr. Mr. Breslin. You can, you can make Breslin. a recommendation. Yeah, so this is you, like you, a date we, we, We've been tangoing around. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> around singing, I think.
president. <laughs> what Tom meant to say was that well, he was a president of Mr. It's Breslin. Mr. Bre there's more Breslin's Mr. associates. Mr. Uh, no, it's not just Breslin yeah. associates either. It's, uh, it's Breslin, Ridyer, Badero associates. They're not wives. Are Financially, <laughs> we, we interviewed and, and discussed the finances during the interview as to the charges. Dick, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make a, dis, um, a point here is that uh, I don't want it to appear that we've discussed this prior to this meeting. It has not been discussed amongst us who we had as favorite architects. I think that's evident in your discussion favorite. tonight, your hesitancy to come out and say, I like <laughs> this person or I like that person. Right here, we can do that, we can do that now. If, if we are interested state. in seeing if there is a consensus or a majority, I think we should just informally poll all the members to find out which architect they feel the was the one that they would like to go with. There have been no discussions, and I don't want it to appear as though we've done and, that outside of an official and, and that was the point of my question. If Tom is ready to recommend someone, at which point if the board does not necessarily, if any member of the board does not agree with that committee recommendation, then we can debate it or discuss it now. Uh, if, if not, and we all favor the same person or the same architect <coughs> team, then there's really no need to do that. We merely vote on Thursday. I think David's suggestion, let's poll. poll. It'll be easier. Just informally. I, mean, just informally. I don't know who everybody likes. I'm curious as so well. We all as say it all the time. I roll call. It's not about it's an, it's an, an preference. Yeah. Yeah. Roll call, uh, for each. You know, I would just like to add that his stood out, in my opinion, so much than the others. Mm -hmm. I would. It would be nice to have seen someone else who compared with the way he designed. Well, it was it was clear during the interview session that his buildings and the artwork and the functionality of his schools were clearly above the other presentations that I saw, and I and I gathered that the the people that used the buildings had a sense of pride, and that's. I think one of the goals that we build the school for is so that the students and the teachers that attend it can be a proud, be proud to go to that school. It's our job also to contain the cost of building that school, but I gained that sense from looking at the building and seeing the way that the buildings were used. To, and, and he was clearly my favorite from, the, from those um, several, discussions. Several board members spoke to me um, over since those interviews, just with impressions, and, and I think that uh, the Breslin group, so just some of the comments that you made to me, um, that his use of light in the schools, um, that, that it reduced the, the cost of energy by using light when he shared in his interview and showed you slides and designs that of, of parts of the building where no lights were on <coughs> all day long, that, that, so the energy costs were low. Um, he spoke extensively about the use of a pitched roof, uh, doubling the life and, and having cost analysis of, of how that breaks down in terms of the life of the building. That's what Bill was saying earlier in terms of the visit. And you an attic, have, Dennis. You can have an initial storage. cost. Storage, storage <laughs> attic. Storage as well in the attic that, that we are in desperate need of storage in buildings. Um, also, his answers, I believe, to technology and, and equipping a building and designing a building for technology and building multiple stories, having students moving on multiple floors and with the cost of land not taking up so much of the footprint of the building by having a sprawling building, but by, by going up and having a multi-story building um, were some of the things. Then, then you've already mentioned the, the, uh, the aesthetics of the building. It, it's, it's not a, you know, his designs aren't Taj Mahal's, but, but clearly they are very attractive buildings that he designs. They, that was some of the feedback that that board members gave me in the, in the last week or so. I didn't get to go on the uh, tour of the schools, but Immaculata College is right next to where I work. So I did go to their library, which was designed by Mr. Breslin and the Breslin Group. It's, besides being exquisite, I mean, it's, it's an incredible building. One of the things that really struck me about it was it is an environment that is conducive to a library. The lighting, the, the way the rooms set up, the way the tables, it is just an environment for learning. And I think we noticed in a lot of his, of the way that he showed in the different buildings that 
he has thought about what a pleasant atmosphere for learning should be, not and using the elements that are around to, to make that a pleasant atmosphere for learning. So I really would like to recommend that we go with Mr. Breslin. So I, I'm, I'm hearing the consensus that, that uh, we'll if, recommend. If uh, Bill is also going to recommend Breslin, and I think we could say that the... Uh, There's something else I'd like to say. Um, one of the things that concerns me about architects is that they draw their pretty pictures and, and hand them out to their GCs and, and then go home, so to speak. And uh, I asked all the architects during the interviews, and fortunately, I know some people I would call Artwood's counterparts who have worked with Breslin, and asked them what kind of response they had during the construction. What kind of problem-solving turnaround time did they have? How many problems did they have? How many changes did they have? And I also asked the same question to the principals at the schools that we visited yesterday, and I got the same answer from everybody. There's few problems, few changes, but when we have them, he's there, he gets on them, and he turns them around, and we fix them and we go on. Very important to me, when we have a time frame and a fixed budget. Two items that I think are very important, not just looking at the building, but the construction of the building. And I felt very comfortable with everybody's response. And I did not get the same response concerning other architects whose buildings we looked at. Thanks, Bill. As a third person from, uh, from the facilities group, I would make it unanimous that I uh, uh, also recommend Breslin based on what I saw, what I heard, and the price. Great. Any other comments? It sounds like it's uh, quite a good consensus here. I, I went on, my oh. tour, on my tour, I, I was reading uh, the uh, resumes and stuff of the principals uh, for the next school that we were going to visit, and I was really looking forward to the next school, even after I saw Breslin School, because they sounded so impressive. And I was <coughs> so disappointed when we got there, based on their, their the final product, compared to the credentials that they went in with. So, uh, and Breslin's credentials are good. I'm not saying that they're not, they're, they're excellent, but credentials alone aren't what you need. Sufficient. And, Great. Hands down. Okay, so there'll be a recommendation on Thursday for uh, hiring Breslin to design a new high school. And in that motion, we will wrap in the fact that they are to use Byro and Dirk Gensel mm -hmm. as the subs. The mechanical engineer and the site right. planner. And, right. and the fee that they had quoted us. Well, the. Yeah. And following your approval, Mr. Uh, Mr. Potash and Mr. Breslin will then hammer out their contract. And right. They've done that on a number of occasions. So. Well, I really, you know, I think part of our, our voting on Thursday is to make sure that that fee that was mentioned to us is the fee that we're having. Right. Because that if that be, goes up, that does make a big difference. That will be the fee. Right. And that's why I was a little Right, right. That will, it be, had, no, it, that will be in your motion and that okay. will be the fee. Because yes. anything above that, then He's certainly witnesses we'd have to look at it. Nine witnesses of what he said. Uh, Great. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, regarding the uh, contract fee as being discussed here, is there a particular reason why we're waiting for the action meeting rather than simply a part of this committee meeting be discussing the different percentages that were? Um, oh, I, I uh, don't think there's a problem with this. I'm just wondering why everyone's dancing around. I, I think the fee is can be as low as the fee is, is five and a half percent, five point five percent, and uh, I think that uh, this community and, and this board needs to be very proud of that fee structure. Uh, it's typically I learned today of a firm uh, in the middle part of the state that has been has been running eight, eight percent, and most architectural firms on a high school project of that size even though it's, it's more dollars than an elementary or middle school, but their fees have typically been six, six and a half percent. So I, I think we can be very comfortable with that 5.5 percent. And I think we should point out, too, that the other two architects that we interviewed 
Uh, the Ray Group came in at five and a half percent. And help me, I can't remember the other Mr. Bozak was was six percent. Was six percent when you added in his cost for the landscaping, so he was higher. Mm -hmm. Well, percentages are abstract. It really depends on what the value you're getting for your dollars. Whether you're taking that of a forty million dollar school at five and a half percent or a $35 million school at 6%. So we have no concrete evaluation on percentages themselves. I will say that the Breslin um, firm was the one that I was most impressed with, although I would also say that there were aspects of the various schools that, that it was very educational in seeing where mistakes were made, whether those mistakes were those of the architect or those of that particular board and the constraints that they placed on the architect. Um, I, I, so as far as choosing an architect, I can agree with the consensus there. I'd like to add, though, right now in this discussion where my concerns are. As I've talked to you before, Art, I personally would like to see uh, something innovative in school construction, which be, would be an architect hired by hourly fee, where they're disenfranchised and disinterested in raising that bottom line dollar. I, I know we've discussed this, and, and certainly you realize the more traditional approach in, in government building is, is going with percentages. But personally, I'd like to see, uh, see some school district accomplish that and would be really happy if it were ours. Uh, second, um, my concerns really don't deal with the architect, but I'd like them on record as far as it would make me feel much more comfortable if we were to move forward with the architect following some very blunt and concise discussions regarding the financial aspects that are directly or indirectly related to the school construction. We still have a great deal number of expenses uh, related to this and costs that have not really been addressed thoroughly. I know some of them will not be answered until the architects and, and the board has moved forward with outlining a school. But uh, to get ballpark figures that are a little bit um, better fine-tuned regarding operating costs of a school, some of the financial impacts that have occurred since the task force has, has uh, given its millage estimate for the construction of that school, we've had things recently that have impacted that. And I'd just like to let the board know that's just where my hesitation we're, is. We're, Vicki, we're going to monitor this thing every step of the way. The first step, though, is deciding on an architect. That's what we're here to do tonight. As we get further along the process, we're going to keep looking at that. We're going to be evaluating it, and we're going to be counting our pennies. And I think that's important not just for you, but for all of us to do that. Well, Dick, there's some things that we, we really have had you know that have come up that I really wouldn't like to wait till grand opening day for, no. for the public disclosure and I really well, feel that we should get and some we're not thought gonna. to a we discussion. We have four more years to do that but we can't debate an architect for the next six months or a year yeah. worrying about those things. We have to get an architect. He's working on a fee basis which we found to be very very reasonable and that's the first step. We'll continue to monitor and have better granulation of the costs and all those other things that we're worried about as we go through the process. It's a long and windy road, and we got to get it started. Okay. I, could I make one more comment, please? Um, as you can tell, I was reluctant when you asked about the recommendation. There were a few other things I wanted to share. I wasn't sure as far as the 5.5%, now we brought that out. One other thing that I want to bring up is some correspondence that I received from Carmen. And I think I talked to that, with Alan about it, and I talked with Art about it, about how Breslin would react um, to a, a request from us somehow we could put, I don't know if this could be put, in, put into the contract or not. Um, and this has to do with House Bill 1819, which is somewhere on the table out in Harrisburg mm -hmm. that has to do with giving school boards relief. Here it said, would he, prevailing wages would exempt school construction from the scope of the Prevailing Wage Act. The House bill grants all local governments the option of complying with the provisions of the Act. Depending on what happens this fall, there could be some big changes and we could be, I mean, the possibility is there. We could be halfway through building this school and it, something could happen here and we could possibly reduce the cost of the Absolutely. building of the school. And in that would, you know, you know Mr. Breslin has said that's he, it's lower than what he would normally charge. Would, would we start getting some um, some some friction or, or any type of uh, of, of, of
comments or requests from Mr. Breslin if something like this would happen. So I was hesitant because there are a couple, I think there's some things that, uh, such as this that would play into it that would certainly, I think, would turn all over to our solicitor. But right. I, just I think it would be our expectation, to Tom, to, for those kinds of ideas for Art and Charles Potash and, and the facilities liaison members, the facilities committee, to sit and talk and make sure those kinds of things can be included in it, in the contract. The prevailing. I also give Mr. Breslin enough uh, credit, credit uh, that he has scoped the cost of the project out from the bare minimum that it would take to build the building that we're talking about to the to the maximum, and and as a savvy a businessman as he is, wouldn't have quoted the price without knowing what the bottom line cost of the building is going to be, even at some even other way. Even substantial reduction yeah. of building a school break. Exactly. Not using exactly. Not, um, well, I think, Tom, by the time you start hiring with the prevailing wage and all, it, the bill will either, will probably pass, I'm hoping at least, I've been bugging enough legislators lately to, to make sure it does pass. So I think when that, that cost comes through, the law will will already be in effect, and it would be incorporated within the cost itself. So I don't think that would be a problem. I think uh, I think what Dick says is true that Mr. Breslin has checked the bottom line, but I think it's you have. I think we have to note that we are North Penn, and I think the fact that he came in at that rate was because of us being North Penn. Um, it's very prestigious to build our school. At least I think you know that's the perception. It certainly a uh, credence to Art's work and, and his people's work that working with him is very easy and it's going to be something that is going to be beneficial for both of them. So I think Mr. Breslin came in for, for reasons of our school district as opposed to just the bottom line. I think you're right, you're Carmen, and we heard other architects actually compliment the district. The Ray Group was very complimentary in, uh, in terms of the work with Art, and also indicated that as a result of building for North Penn, they had a lot of spin-off business, and other school districts looking at the same design we use with Gwinnett Square, and that we're now using in the two other schools. So uh, I think the Breslin Group really, really was accurate when they said that um, having this school district would really be good for their business and, and a good spin-off business and we're willing to sharpen their pencil. Yeah. Well, Dick, I, just, I have one additional comment. I, I have a new comfort level with both Tom and, and Bill. We're going to have some expertise as far as the design phase is concerned. Tom's mechanical background or mechanical systems. Bill's background on hardware and architectural hardware, door clock stores, that type of thing. And, and it's really going to help. In, in Vicky's concern about being responsible. I mean, we've always been responsible, but now we have more expertise than we've ever had to design any of our buildings. And I, I think that's going to serve us well. And there's, there's, there's one more thing that I think that, that ties into that, Vicki, and that, that is that, that Breslin was the only one that emphasized building the building for life cycle cost, reducing the life cycle cost of the building and, and as you know, that's the bottom line when you do the budget every year is what, what it takes to operate, what it takes to build, and et cetera. So it might take us a little bit more to build it, but uh, it's going to save us in the long run. And I, I think that was the key. So um, We'll get a copy of the contract before we approve it. Absolutely. Because we don't build schools, second high schools, very often. Right. Well, and you, some you, of us actually read that stuff. There would be a, a motion from the Facilities Committee on the agenda next week to approve Breslin as the architect at, at the fee specified. The actual contract oh. then would come back at a later date, probably several weeks, when it's hammered out and the Facilities Committee is involved in that. You would get a copy um, well in advance so that you can read it, and um, then you would vote on the contract as well. So I think it would be a two-step two process. Right. Was there any talk of liquidated damages for it not being rendered over at uh, time, time needed, time requested? We, we have not. You know, one of the things I would rather do, quite frankly, kind of liquidated damages, any time you insert liquidated damages, people put a cost in their bid to cover their liquidated damages. And I would rather have the construction sure. time frame to be comfortable enough that we don't need to enforce liquidated damages. You can put, you know, you put a $1,000 a day penalty in, and I can tell you that if a contractor thinks he's going to run 30 days late, he has built $30,000 
plus another 20 because you've insulted him with liquidated damages. So I would rather, I like our time frame, and I, I don't see, quite frankly, a need for liquidated damages. That's, that's not so much from an architect's perspective. You know, one of the things that they will say, Don, is very interesting. Let's work it both ways. If I bring it in six months early or three months early, will you pay me a premium? And, and that's a good point. I mean, there are some contractors. Our contractor right now at Bridal Path is saying, I've bid this job so tight that the only way I'm going to make money is to deliver your building early. And I will have that building for you in mid-July. I like that. That's great. I mean, that's, that's great. So that's that, that's the way I, I you know liquidated damages. Yeah. If you don't know your contract, Ken right. just said time will tell. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Any other board discussion? We'll have that Any questions from the audience? <coughs> okay. Thanks. Next uh, item is Ken policy and Will Allen. Yes. Tonight, we are scheduled for the first reading of a new board policy regarding the acceptance of awards and honors to the school district or individual schools. Since everyone in the audience and everybody on the board has a copy in their packet, I will not read the content of this policy. This policy will be on the agenda for next Thursday night for the second reading. That will be the first one. First, the first, the first reading. You can only do that on the, the okay. Anyone with questions or concerns, Paul, Ken Weir, or myself. Who, who is the author? Yes, it is. I don't know it's a collected author. Say again? No, I just asked who is the author of this, uh, uh, and it's collected, and I just, that's fine. I think it was initiated under our former policy liaison, Mr. Bowman. Yes. Well, Bow. <laughs> we, won't, we won't discuss that. <laughs> Why I got the idea. <laughs> well, that's oh, good. Bring it up. Go ahead, bring it up. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. No, no, no. Shall no, we no. go to the calendar? I'm not a glad to make the decision. <laughs> and, and Ken uh, had a big part in writing. So uh, I think it's one of those things that we need to have on the books. And it's important. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, here again, if you have any questions. Are there any questions from the board members of Bill or Ken? Good any job. Any members of the audience who? Like I have a question on the awards policy. <coughs> okay. Can I just say that because of the videotaping, should there be any kind of reference as to what we're talking about for a lost audience out there? You'd be surprised. People do watch these things. Well, the reading will be on the With the video on Thursday. Okay, but it'll be a separate showing. Okay. Yeah. I'm just so stay tuned. <laughs> we'll next Thursday, It'll be a cliffhanger. We'll get on with the camera. What will we do next? Yeah, it's like a soap opera. <laughs> We're just wetting their appetite, so they're going to watch the next one. Okay, I think we're going to talk school calendars now, right? Yes. Why? Dr. Ock. We've already used the um, We need to talk about two time? calendars this evening. First, the current school calendar. Last May, the board adopted a calendar that um, was for 184 <coughs> student days and 190 teacher days. Uh, that was a calendar that reflected the board's position in negotiations with the North Penn Education Association, the Teachers Association. Now, the board was interested in a longer calendar. Since that con uh, calendar approval, uh, the board has changed its position relative to the length of the uh, school year. I believe the board's position currently is, is an attempt to negotiate, it's been announced publicly, a 187-day calendar. Uh, the problem that we have with the present calendar is in the absence of a teacher contract, um, we have to revert to the status quo. And the status quo means that uh, a calendar needs to uh, be the same amount of time, the same number of days as the previous uh, contracted time with the teachers. So it would be 185 days with the teachers. I'm concerned because, uh, and I brought this forward to revise the calendar to, to more accurately reflect where we are, uh, families are beginning to call saying, well, what will the calendar be for this year? Is it going to be 190-day calendars, 185-day calendar? 
people are beginning to make their vacation plans for the end of the year. And I think um, we owe it to our community to try to, uh, to the extent possible, um, correct the calendar um, and be more honest about the number of days. Um, I say that knowing that the calendar that you have here, uh, the first calendar in your packet is the one that's currently in force with 184 and 190 days, and the second calendar, 93, 94, on, on the back of that for the audience or the board, revised 11, um, 111, 94 for 180 days and 185 days uh, is, is already in trouble in the sense that uh, <laughs> since this calendar was put together a week and a half ago, um, <laughs> um, um, believe it or not, we've had three snow days for those people who, who aren't aware of that. And they all have occurred in January, and as recently as uh, yesterday, I believe. Um, <laughs> and there may be another one tomorrow, so. Uh, please. <laughs> Uh, with, with that in mind, with, with that in mind, um, what, what we need to consider, if you, if you look at the revised January 11, 1994 calendar, what we've basically done is taken out an in-service day that we had built in the original calendar in May and made it a student instructional day. And you will see an asterisk for June 10th, 1994 as the last student day. But you know that we have had three snow days, which would make June 15th currently our last day. And we can adjust this calendar by going down to the bottom right and adding some additional snow makeup days and, and say, for example, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 20, and 21 as snow makeup days, and we tack them on at the end of the year. Um, I, I do want to add one additional comment. Um, we do have a, a holiday uh, scheduled, January 17th, Martin Luther King holiday. I had, had one parent call and say, well, you will cancel that holiday. And it is not my recommendation that we cancel that holiday. And I'll explain two reasons why. Um, that holiday is in this calendar for a purpose. And, it's, um, and I think it would give the wrong message in this community. I also um, know from families that holidays that are scheduled in the calendar uh, well in advance, such as Martin Luther King's <laughs> holiday, uh, families plan activities. And if we were to, to pull the rug out and make that a school day now at the 11th hour, uh, it would certainly disrupt some of those families that do have those planning. Um, I think it would be just as wrong to do that as it would to go into the Easter vacation and uh, or the, the spring vacation, I should say, um, and, and pull a day out of that. Uh, the district has built its snow days at the end of the school year because years ago, snow days were built into other holidays and community members began to complain because they could never plan their holidays. They never knew in advance um, whether they were going to shorten the spring vacation or the Christmas vacation or other kinds of holidays like that. So I think it's uh, still valid to build the snow days in at the end of the year and make the days up then. And what I would prefer to do for you in terms of a vote for next Thursday night is just to add uh, three additional snow days onto the calendar because we are only at um, January 9th, I believe, today, or 10th, 11th, 11th. 11th. Oh, well, whatever. And uh, <laughs> it's, 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 Art, it's been, Art, it's been a long word. week, hasn't it? <laughs> why, can't, question, why can't we just leave the current calendar as it is? We're going to catch up with it in two weeks. Should we not catch up with it? Just add, give them a day off, say, add it to the Easter break, because that's the extra, that's the fourth day for the, for the students. And this way, everybody knows that the 17th is the last day of school. The I mean, we're going to end up using it. There's the no answer. The current calendar does not fit the contract. Right. First off, you have one additional in-service day built in, okay. so that would make it invalid. And, the, and we don't have 190 day, 190 instructional days. So I, I think it's more confusing to leave the existing calendar, which is wrong, than to just correct the calendar, have the board vote next week, and put it out with the principals into the newsletters and send it out to homes and say, here's our calendar, here are the snow makeup days, put an accompanying paragraph with it in the newsletter explaining the calendar change. and and making simple simple business of this calendar. And, and but you're only two days away from having it look the same exact way. 
that's right, but it's still inaccurate. And it's inaccurate from, from the number of days we have the teachers going to. Technically, the last day of school is the 15th and not, and not the 17th. So we're as of the 11th, we can make the 15th point here just the 16th, 17th, 20th, 21st can become the new snow. Yes. Since we are revising it as of January 11th, so I'd recommend that we do that. Any other discussion? Just a question. Do we set when graduation is? That's all determined as of April 1st. April 1st, that gets set up. Right, right now, Tom, with the 15th being our scheduled last day, barring no additional school emergency closings, we would probably make the 16th or the 17th our graduation day, a Thursday evening or Friday evening. Assuming. Assuming. And if the 17th and I, Believe the last me, I'm not going to assume that the last day is I like the signs that we do it across the globe. The 17th. They already made it. We've planned to make the last day. Right. So if we go to the 17th, then the 17th will be graduate commencement. Mm -hmm. Typically, it is the last student yes. day. Typically, yes. every day. Mm -hmm. we go past that? Well, then we have problems. Well, we go past that. We have two alternatives. We could allow seniors to graduate with less than 180 days. We could waive a day and still make their graduation on a Friday and not make them come back on a Monday. That's some of the questions that I've heard. Yeah. If the graduation is on the 17th, which is a Friday, are their kids going to be required to come back a Monday after that to get the necessary days? Know that. Once, we, once we get through the... Maybe Swati would like to go. <laughs> we, we solved that last year with the first. We'll know that, and we, we can make a decision with that. That's just one more day to throw jello. Yeah, you're right. I will begin to hear from families of seniors in another month or so, suggesting that regardless of when we end the school year, that we would have graduation by that Friday, really. I mean, they, because of families coming in for the graduation, grandparents and the like, and right. weekend plans and all those sorts of things. A, a question, a number of our schools uh, uh, are used for polling places and the uh, revised calendar, I believe, will have those schools open with students in them on, on election day. That has not been the case over the last several years. As, is the staff can be prepared for that? That's my question. We're just going to have to accommodate it at this point, Ralph, I think, because the we don't have another solution in terms, unless the uh, North Penn Education Association and board agree to, to a, a lengthier year, and you still have time to do that between now and May 17th. And so maybe there's an impetus for the board and the association to get together and do your. Well, I never. As long as they're not contract. working the polls. I mean, there's no reason. I think <laughs> the decision was made way back to not open the schools where. A lot of the elementary schools like to have the schools open during election because the kids learn that way and, and they, they have things that they do. Charlie, do you want to I mean, I'm it, just telling It is true that there is some learning involved by having children visit the polls, but uh, there are far greater <coughs> problems associated with it, such as lack of parking. Uh, in some places, the polling places are in lobbies and gymnasiums, and it is disruptive, so that's what has taken us to this solution. To the point there, is a, there is another alternative. We can close schools on May 17th. It would not be a student day. It would not be a teacher day. The schools would be available as polling places, and we tack another day on. But then what that does is then the 16th becomes the last day and it gives us only one, one day course, left yeah. for snow, and then we're into the week of the 20th, and then we begin to have some problems in terms of seniors, especially who are going off to colleges like Penn State that might have an early um, attendance, and, and you start to get into those kinds of problems. You're cutting into the, the summer jobs of, of the high school students who are trying to put money away for college, and you start to have a, a drop of attendance. By that week of June 20th, that's when you really start to see high school attendance. Now, given that between now and Thursday when we print out the snow that we don't have, at, we have not added two more snow days because with school's been closed. I mean, that's, you know. That's, that's always a possibility. Uh, you know, so you may be back to this one. After we one. might be back to right. the other one, yes, Carmen. Absolutely. Um, 94, 9, are we finished? Uh, mm -hmm. why, don't we, why don't we do both calendars and if anybody has any okay. questions at that point, then they can the 94-95 calendar, um, we're getting this out for a board reaction and hopefully an approval. 
a little earlier than last year. I, I did say <laughs> earlier the 93-94 calendar was approved in May. Uh, we're putting it out earlier because we did, I did have requests from parents who, uh, believe it or not, want to begin to plan their vacations for next year already. Um, our recommendation is that we would start school with students on September 8th. Um, that would occur uh, after Labor Day and um, after Rosh Hashanah, the, the first day of the Jewish holiday, Rosh Hashanah. Um, the calendar reflects a 187-day school year, which is the current board position. Um, it builds in some in-services and parent conferences and the traditional holidays. And you'll see that May 16th is an in-service day, Ralph, on that calendar, and that is Election Day. And um, maybe the only other suggestion I might have in, in this calendar, given the weather we've had over the last two years, that instead of four snow makeup days, maybe we would put five or six into it, just so that <laughs> people would be aware of that. And um, <laughs> right. So uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much. Um, it's a, a fairly traditional calendar. Um, Labor Day is is, is on the. 5th of September, we want to stretch and start the school year a little bit late, give Art a little bit more window in the opening of Walton Farm and uh, Bridal Path, even though Bridal Path is going to be done July 15th. And uh, it would be our recommendation for the 94-95 calendar as such. I'll support this, but I think that you pointed out about the week of the 20th, which uh, uh, I think you, you run very close to the week of the 20th and 94. Um, one of the things, and it's, you know, nobody likes it, but a lot of people yeah, have problems, nice. and a lot of our seniors have problems when, when school goes into the week of the 20th. And what the other solution, while a lot of people don't like it, is the, the spring break and taking some of the break, spring bake for snow days. And uh, while a lot of people like to plan that week off, if it's going to, if it's going to hurt our seniors, then I'd rather tell those people that, yes, those are, the, you know, Two or three of those days at the spring break uh, uh, would be snow days, and, and right. that could ease the pressure in the end. I think if we're going to do that, we need to do that and have a board consensus to do that yes, now, so that families right. aren't planning to be right. away that entire right. that entire week, okay. or if they are. I mean, frankly, the um, families today take vacations. A number of families take vacations when they when they want to take vacations and we'll go to principals and, and request um, an educational trip and, and take their children out of school. Um, so whatever the board's pleasure is, we're, we're willing to make the snow makeup days on the week of April or tack them on at the end. I would really like, though, to keep the start of the school year as late as possible to give us that window with Bridal Path and Walton Farm. I, I think we have it this year anyway. I think we have a day or two slack there, and I, you know, I would I would support your recommendation, but I would look at it for the following year. If we get into continue to get into trouble around the, the end of June, then I think we ought to look at going back. I think the following year. Out. I think the following year the solution would be that, that maybe we would start school earlier. Some school districts. Souderton and some of our other neighbors actually bring the youngsters back a little bit before Labor Day. Calendars become a tradition in a community. You talked about um, the, the Easter week holiday. There are a number of school districts in Lancaster County and York County that, that only have off that Thursday and Friday. And, and the rest of the days are school days. They don't even have that week <coughs> off. And I think it's whatever the tradition is that you want to establish. But what I found is when you break a tradition in a community and you start talking about bringing kids in before Labor Day and starting earlier, you, you get a backlash from that. Well, we may be forced also to do that anyway because of state legislation that they're going to be extending this, the, uh, the instructional days to begin with. So yes. It's something, you know, it's always fluctual. I think Ralph brings up a good point. <coughs> But that asterisk at the 15th, that gives, you have one or two snow days, and that almost automatically pushes graduation back then to the, the what's that, the Friday the 23rd. Yeah. You're right. So I think he makes a real strong point. I, I, could, I could support that. Okay. Any, any other supporters for the April week to put snow days there? No. No? Yes. Yes? <laughs> 
I never get the garbage taken out by my kids if I do that. You can write an educational I'd rather see it start a day earlier. Because I think the way it's said, it's almost yeah. Yeah. No. I can. No, no, those are the days between Palm Sunday and Easter, right? Yes. No, that's Holy Week. I, I would not support it. We just will pray that there's not a lot of snow days next year. Maybe we'll get lucky next year with snow. Right. Well, actually, we didn't have any problem with snow this year. It's just ice. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah. We call them ice days. Yeah. Ice days. Dick, you yeah. just said that we're going to get 10 inches tonight, and that's when yeah, we'll I have a snow, snow day. <laughs> I can't do it anymore with that ice. Yeah, the roads were much better up in the Poconos, and they had a foot to 16 inches of snow, but you can plow snow. Right. <laughs> Is there any questions from the audience uh, pertaining the uh, calendars? Thank you, Starchio. I just want to follow up on what Ralph said. I think that it is very true that when the schools are closed and the kids are home on election days, uh, it inhibits many stay-at-home parents, moms, from getting out and voting. And I would urge you if you can find a way to accommodate the election process with the educational process since the two have a direct bearing on each other or one has a direct bearing on the other uh, that you try to do that. 94 is going to be um, a school board election year and the administration has made it clear that it likes to have parents involved in their children's education. There's no more important way to be involved than to vote. But if you're stuck at home with the kids and you can't get to the polls, you can't do that. So if you could try to work on that, I think the voters would appreciate it. Well, the, in in 94, 95, to clarify, the November election is a day off for the children. It's a parent conferencing day for the, the, the teachers. Right. And, and so parents come to the kids can't go in the polls with the, with the adult and learn what's going on. I, I don't think children are allowed in the polling Absolutely. places. I take mine in. Yes, they do. Are, are they? Okay. Yeah. Well, in any event, I do know that a lot, a lot of moms never get out on election day, and it's because they're stuck at home with the kids because they're home from school. So. Thank you. Thanks, Any other? Good evening, I'm Linda Abram, I'm a parent at Gwynnor, and I want to commend you for kind of trying to clarify the uh, days of our calendar. I think many parents are confused and concerned about when the last day of school will be. Many people have mentioned to me that they're leaving on the 17th, 18th, or 19th to take their vacation and, you know, doesn't matter when it's going to snow. I would ask you to consider an option to the snow days, tacking them on at the end. I don't know if there's any easy solution to this, but um, I do think that once you make a decision, I would hope that maybe we could make it a policy that we could stick to for a number of years so that we could all kind of rely on it. So that's just what I wanted to say. A policy on snow days? Right? Yes. You yes. Mean whether we put them in, into the calendar or tack them on? The yes. Plan? Whether we have it at the Easter break or whether we tack them on, you know, do we do we block in say four days? I know that statistically it's been shown that since 1989 our winters have become more severe, and as you will recall, we've had probably a lot more snow days in that period of time from 89 now than prior to that. For quite a while we had many mild winters, and I'm sure that came into play when decisions were made, but. Um, it seems like now we're just struck with a lot of days that we, you know, are problem solving as parents what to do with our kids. And I think a policy that would be uh, continuous from year to year would be very helpful. So I don't think it's easy, but I, I hope you come up with a good solution for us. Dr. Alka, that's a good idea. And I think uh, Judy will uh, bear me out that many, many custody arrangements that our children in this district are involved in and a part of. Uh, the court orders split up vacations, they split up the summers. And when these happen, one parent or the other gets cheated out of that free time with their child and you know the court isn't going to sort out a snow day for anybody's district but a parent's going to take a loss and that's just too bad and I, I know the district has to take those court orders quite seriously when children are you know <coughs> given over or transferred whatever and uh, by having a policy setting a firm calendar and a consistent way of handling those days 
uh, helps in those court-ordered matters? Well, we're willing to set the snow days either the Easter week or at the end of the year at the board's direction, but I don't hear um, enough board members and a consensus to say to set them at Easter. Uh, Terry just leaned over to me and said, we did have them at Easter at one time, and mm -hmm. the reason we took them off of Easter is because of families wanting to travel during Easter week, and it created a lot of, a lot but, of problems. But the problem that. then comes with the families trying to go at the end of the year. Yes. So it's, it's, it's one or the other. Yeah. But if we make one decision and, and keep with it on a consistent basis, then parents that are involved in a split custody situation can live with it. Mm -hmm. And they there draft were, their agreements around that. There are some districts that actually build in their calendar yes. school snow days. Yes. <laughs> if they have, and if they don't? If they have more uh, contract with their teachers for more than 180 instructional days, and we don't, we don't have that at, at this point. Or if we want to start the year earlier. Why? Why I mean, because they would get the days off. If well, you build them in and, and the snow days weren't used, then what they do is they, they extend the Easter break or they extend or they add an extra day or whatever. They extend the, the uh, Memorial Day weekend. So that, I, I don't understand that. Where they, they are, I mean, I'm not sure which school district, no, but, the, the but they actually add. build them into the calendar. If, if it's a snow day, they don't make it up because they have in, in excess of exactly. 180 days. But that's right. right. Because of their teacher's contract. Right, and we don't have If we had 185 days with our teacher's contract for teaching right. days, no, they would we still could lose five. No, if you're saying it nets out at 180. Right. You give them off, give them the you day give, off. You still give them off the same day. Yeah. You give them another day off somewhere else. Yeah, you, that's you, all. Well, you're doing the same thing. But the whole point of doing that is you have to either start earlier or you're going to end up at the same place. Not. Right. Or but the whole point is is to days. to. You just can't pack more days in the year. Well, I think you that's start early. Early. But if you're estimated, yeah, right. If you start earlier with four, but at least your ending date will always be your ending date, and your Easter break would not be taken over. And if those four where, where days, would you, where would if, you take the days? Where would you? Where would you? At the beginning them? of, you would put the days at the beginning of the school year right. is what you would end up doing. But he said it was for a very specific reason this school year that we're not Just doing that. So it's exactly. right for, for this one. I understand, but after ninety four ninety five, if we actually had four days built into our calendar then where we started our school something. earlier, if the, the teachers. If the contract for the teachers is 185 days, and those four days, God forbid, it doesn't snow. I mean, my daughter will be distraught. But if it doesn't snow, then they would get four days. You would either add it on, you would tag it on somewhere. I think in the calendar, we'll hear that. Right. No, I'm finished. I'm, I'm <laughs> intrigued by your conversation. Like we forgot all about <laughs> No, that's OK. <laughs> I didn't want to be dismissed unless I was a yeah. Or board members, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, please. Uh, Alan has another yeah. Dr. Uh, school district was very saddened to learn that um, Mr. Byrne Ziegler, a former board member and former president of the North Penn Board of School Directors, uh, passed away this weekend in Florida. He was traveling in Florida. And uh, I know a number of people in the community and uh, members of the board know the Ziegler family and, and want to remember them. Um, Vern served on the North Penn board for a period of 10 years. And uh, Thursday at Trinity Lutheran Church, uh, there will be a uh, service at 11 AM. And anyone who wants to visit and call on the family can do so beginning at 9.30 AM. And that would be at Trinity Lutheran Church. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Dr. Mm -hmm. There will be an executive session after this meeting uh, to discuss personnel matters and many other items.